Hey everyone, it's been a minute and wow, things have really gone off the rails since I've been gone. The World Health Organization has declared coronavirus a global pandemic. We begin pandemic. today with the US and our nation on the brink. Terrifying scale of Australia's bush fires. Unemployment to its ridiculous. highest level since the Great Depression. Overnight, Minneapolis on fire. <laughs> Protesters leaving an off. Good year to take off, I suppose. Seriously though, I hope you all have been keeping relatively safe and healthy throughout all of this chaos. Now, it's been just over one year since I stepped away from social media. Some of you may not have even noticed that I was gone. I dropped borderless, left a small note, and dipped. And I suppose because I was so vague, I really left room for people to impose their own narratives on my departure. A lot of things have been said about me since I left. Some far more slanderous than others, and I'm sure I'll address that at some point. However, I don't want to waste this video in particular mud wrestling with pigs, especially when you just get dirty and they just get happy. So instead, how about we talk about where I've actually been and what my actual motivation was for leaving politics? Well, firstly, I have some really exciting news that many of you had no idea about last year, which is that I was married and pregnant, and I just found out about my son right before the release of Borderless. I have always kept my cards close when it comes to my family because unfortunately, the modern political coliseum seems to have zero boundaries whatsoever or respect for people's privacy, but I did decide to share a tiny bit this January on my Instagram just because it's something that has brought me so much joy and is such a blessing in these crazy times. It was pretty hard to not at least put a bit of it out there for you. But definitely it was a very special thing for me and an important thing for the first part of my son's life and his birth to be just for myself and just for my family. None of the social media or the world's eyes on it. That was just for us. Another thing I did was I took some time to get back into education and to nurture a more contemplative part of my soul and my faith and really recenter what was important in my life, like family, friendships, and community. It is definitely an interesting experiment to take a step back from the internet for at least a few months, see what's left of your life when you take away the social media, the internet fame, and the online tribes you're a part of. Have you built something meaningful outside of that? Is your purpose still there when the screen is off? There was definitely a point where I don't think I could have said yes to this. And there are probably far too many people that are Gen Z or millennial like me that have been in that boat before. Which brings me to another point, and that is family was not the only reason I took a step back, although it was a main one. I had planned to take an extended break from the internet and media for a while anyways, just to get my head out of the fishbowl and observe with a sober view the world that I was a part of. And to be real with you guys, the world I was a part of, especially earlier on in my YouTube career, was a very unhealthy one. And I mean, <laughs> to be fair, most of you have probably been on Twitter before, so pointing out the toxicity of political or even just internet culture in general is probably the least shocking thing you have heard this year. Um, <laughs> wow, the internet is toxic and it's bad for you. Shocking revelation, Lauren. Seriously though, uh, I do want to be clear actually that when I'm talking about this toxic culture, especially in politics, I am not talking about regular everyday conservatives or regular liberals. What I am talking about is the forever onliners, the people who have lost themselves to a character or entire personality composed of partisan talking points. The extremists who can no longer see the humanity in their political opponents or even just other groups based on race or gender. The leaders of all these movements that are fighting over the last shreds of a dwindling social talking point market. And the cults that have seemingly formed where everyone views themselves as the hero in the story whilst anyone on the other side is irredeemable scum. Then of course there's just the 24-hour news cycle in general which seems to make anyone involved just focus in on people's worst moments, their mental breakdowns and bad arguments like a shark searching for blood. We have entered an age where your worst two minutes will define you for the rest of your life because that's what people want to click on. A world void of nuance. One where even serious political debate has just been substituted for partisan sneering and mockery. 
argumentum ad cringe, if you will, where we seem to have taken the position that if something can be mocked, that it can't possibly be right, as if human instinct about what's laughable is somehow divinely inspired. This whole mess, this whole just disaster that I was a part of, it is something that I, I began realizing in people around me, and then I started to see within myself as well that I was actively assisting in creating this culture of entertainment and hot take politics. So I think it was mid-2018, I decided I wanted to change the way I approached things and do only documentaries instead, a more meaningful deep dive into the issues that I cared about. And I truly loved how this experience went. Instead of some big dramatic closing paragraph to my last documentary, Borderless, concluding the situation one way or the other, we concluded that there were two sides to every story, that perhaps everyone involved was a victim of political and business corruption, that these big polarizing issues are so often far more gray than we realize, that the migrants we sat with in the camps and on the shores of Turkey that were taking dinghy boats to what they saw and believed was going to be a better life promised to them by traffickers and politicians, that that was a human story, a human struggle worthy of being told. The same human struggle that I've always recognized amongst people in Europe who feared the loss of their culture and the economic and social impacts to change in their home. Too often in media, it is treated as if these experiences are mutually exclusive. And I used to have this perspective as well, that because the mainstream media or the leftist media was already telling one side of the story, that it was my job to tell the other. But in reality, it should be everyone's job to show both. And just because you see others not doing it doesn't mean you should partake in a childish tit for tat. Otherwise, you're not going to get the real story at all. You, you need a full picture in order to come to meaningful, insightful conclusions. And this is one of the big reasons that I've decided to come back now. I am seeing absolute chaos going on in the world and very little room for nuance or genuine thoughtful content. Our news is getting summed up by spliced Twitter videos made to promote one cause or another, name calling, doxing, hashtag wars. <laughs> it's really hard to watch. And I really believe that people are longing for a more sober approach because the world is a lot more complex than just all cops bad, all cops good, post black square or you're a racist, or black people are all just looters and rioters. I'm not some radical centrist here, but I think we all know deep down these massive cultural issues have human stories to them, to every side of them. And too often we prefer to just ignore the humanity and the stories that don't quite fit with our narrative. And you know, in my traveling and my on the ground work with Borderless, even just life experience over this last year, a big way that I've changed personally, and one of the best things I've learned, is to approach things with a sense of, I don't know everything. Because none of us do. I think the people in charge of public discourse in our society too often are expected to be experts in everything. Celebrities, politicians, social commentators, were literally coached to avoid ever saying the phrase, I don't know. You find a way around it, you give a super general answer, or you read the answer your publicist wrote for you, and you better be able to give a smile and a word to every social and political crisis the news pops out that week, or you're a moron, or you're cancelled for being silent. And what this has led to is this bizarre culture at the moment where everyone has to take a stance on things, even if they feel completely uneducated on a subject. I have friends of mine posting black squares on their Instagram and messaging me after saying, I have no idea what this means, but I don't want people to hate me. I have other friends of mine in acting and media who have had their publicists or agents force them to make statements through gritted teeth on recent political issues because it's bad for their career if they don't. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what your cause is to me, even if it's something I'm extremely supportive of even if it's something super basic that we should all understand and agree on, at no point in a well-functioning society should every single person, every single corporation, every single politician, beauty guru, appliance shop, and even your Xbox <laughs> feel the need to put out a political statement for fear of the masses taking their silence as betrayal 
and socially or even financially ostracizing and destroying them. Compelled speech just never really ends well. Because what happens when that message isn't so kind? What happens when you create a culture like this and that message becomes one that is violent or oppressive and no one is allowed to question it and everyone is afraid of speaking up, let alone to even be silent on an issue? It's not like things like this haven't happened in history before. And when people get into lockstep, it is very hard to get them out because no one wants to take that fall. It's creating an extremely dangerous precedent and I don't want that precedent to ever be set one way or another. And this is why going forward in documentary making, I don't plan to be a part of any political groups. I want to be open to any conclusion when I investigate an issue. We have got way too much egoistic certainty in media and that's something I really hope to work to pull myself away from. And you know what, I just want to leave it at that with going forward because I was initially thinking about doing this video where I clarify my beliefs. I explain that I'm not this extremist that people think I am, that I'm just curious for the truth without hate. And I wrote this whole thing explaining it and then I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, why do I care so much about these people that are misrepresenting me? When the kind of growth that I'm pursuing as an individual and as a creator isn't one forced by a crowd of progressives demanding an apology tour and that I change my opinions on videos I've made or they'll ban me and cancel me. Because that's not growth. That's just more appealing to a mob and it's not real. And I know people that can chant progressive slogans through gritted teeth to keep their jobs or because their agents told them to do it and it's just not something I can do. I don't see it. It's, it's not genuine. It's not real and I think people should know that. I think they should know that a lot of the celebrities and the people they look up to in media and politics and their YouTube heroes that make posts about politics, they don't always believe those things in private. They're doing it because they don't want to be axed or guillotined by the public right now. And you know, I also want to mention that I also don't see the possibility for growth when I'm constricted by the expectations of an online right-wing tribe that I hold certain beliefs or that, or I'm not a part of them anymore. Because I also have questions and criticisms within the right as well. There are some issues there. I want to just genuinely look at the world, even if it bursts my bubble of what my preconceived notions may have been. So maybe because I've been gone so long and I've kind of made these statements, people will want some sort of statement on where my views are at now. Well, I am growing as a person. I don't know everything and I am excited to learn more and I want to let my work speak for me going forward. If anything, I'd say I've taken the real life pill. I think people are multidimensional complex beings and they are worthy of trying to understand. You can't sum them up in a tweet you found six years ago and you can't sum them up as a race or a gender, which too often polarizing political internet communities try to do. It really sometimes feels like we are just caught up in this massive maelstrom of lies and I mean, Peterson has mentioned this before too. We just need to, we need people to start speaking honestly. And a lot of the problems we're facing could be fixed. <laughs> we need to stop with the carefully constructed statements to avoid social and political landmines or the chaotic partisan talking points. Anyways, I could talk for ages on this subject, but I do want to eventually get to the big ticket item here. And that is that after a year of being away and considering all of this and looking at the absolute state of the world right now, I want to make documentaries again. And I want to make some damn good ones because I have seen how valuable it has been for my own life and how valuable it is for so many others. I still to this day get tons of emails telling me how Borderless really changed people's perspectives and how people wish I'd make more content like that. I get your messages. I read them all. I appreciate them. I know I can't always reply, but I do read them all. And genuinely, they really convinced me that I should come back and try to change some of the things in this world instead of being so jaded by media. So coming back into media, I really want to go forward approaching the world with a genuine open mind, open to both the rational and emotional aspects of being human, not facts over feelings, but facts and feelings, because facts help us operate in this world, but love and compassion are what make it worthwhile. We have to show people why the statistics and graphs matter. 
Rather than commentating with such confidence and zealotry from the stands, I want to enter the arena and give those on the ground a voice. Instead of taking down the straw men, I want to highlight the steel men on both sides, offering the best and brightest to challenge your mind. I don't want to set my eyes on any exact documentary yet, because there are at least a dozen I'm considering. Definitely what's going on in the States is a big one. However, I really want to invite you guys to be a part of the documentary making process as well helping me narrow down and decide which documentary I'm going to make, seeing how the creation, filming, and editing occurs behind the scenes. Plus, this will really help finance the creation of these documentaries themselves. I often think about how it would be significantly cheaper, less stressful, just doing four-minute videos, social commentary with my webcam on the latest terrible Vice article that came out. <laughs> There's definitely... Uh, no overhead cost, security, flights, hotels, sleepless nights, or getting arrested by the Turkish police or military. <laughs> Hell, I mean, man, documentaries are stressful. There was one Airbnb we stayed in in Spain where we literally had to boil like four pots of water for an hour if you wanted to take a bath that week. And that was just how it went. You know, it's, I'm not, I'm going to be real. It's not easy making documentaries. They are stressful. They are hard work. And there are a lot easier things to do in media, but it's doing something meaningful. It's not just taking shots from a comfortable studio or living room. It's really exploring what's going on on the ground. And that's what makes it worthwhile. So I really do hope some of you consider joining me on that mission. If you'd like, you can go and check out the links below this video and join me on Subscribestar because I can't really be on Patreon, can I? <laughs> uh, I also know though that it is tough times. So if you can't support me, no worries. I always intend to make my documentaries free to watch because the intention of them is for as many people to have their perspectives broadened as possible. So I suppose going forward, I will see some of you on my next live stream on Subscribestar, where I'll be answering your questions and chatting about my pitches. And as for everyone else, I'll probably see you at my next documentary announcement once it's confirmed. I am now going to go sing the Bananas and Pajamas theme song for the 400th time this week to my son and probably get covered in sweet potato mush. But while I'm not doing that, I really look forward to doing my second favorite thing, which is creating again and hopefully bringing back some meaningful, sane conversation into this crazy world. Genuinely, I hope for the best for you all, and God bless. I'll see you soon.